Yeah. Okay. Um, so good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, really appreciate everyone turning out for this and, and the folks, the folks on Zoom. Um, like Shimada said, I have been an organizer for the last 20 years now, working uh, back home in a native Connecticut, New York City, and Philadelphia for the last 12 years. Um, in regards to Puerto Rico, like the introduction said, it started out when I was 19 years old around the issue of political prisoners and has since moved on, um, beginning with the youth group, or sort of like a youth wing of the Puerto Rican Independence Party in Connecticut, and then later joined the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party in 2004, of which um, I'm still a member. And so what we're going to do today is a very brief, it, it's, it's a brief attempt at taking the history that we learned last week and putting it into sort of a political, economic, historical context, specifically looking at the uh, the resistance to colonization and statehood, right? So now as statehood has come back up again in the news with both traditional annexationists wanting Puerto Rican state, but now also Democratic Party and other folks chiming in on that, right? Um, the issue of Puerto Rican resistance, nationhood to that, right? The statehood has come up again. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today for this for this presentation. Um, and so very quickly, right? What do we know about Puerto Rico? The most basic, especially those of us who are not Puerto Rican, what do you know about Puerto Rico? Puerto Rico is a free nation, it's a Latin American nation, it's a colony of the United States, it's a military outpost, it's a tourist destination, right? One of the more popular tourist destinations in the Caribbean. Um, it's the home of bad money, right? Everybody knows Puerto Rico is bad money. And most importantly, it's where Puerto Ricans are from, right? And so what's Puerto Rico today? Puerto Rico today is suffering with the greatest economic crisis in the history of the country, right? And Puerto Rico has suffered a lot of economic crises. So what we're facing now today and what the nation as a whole is facing today is pretty unprecedented, unseen um, at, at this level in this history. A combination of both economic, right, economic catastrophes and climate disasters, Hurricane Maria, this series of never ending uh, earthquakes that happened afterward, right? That was never really a thing in, in Puerto Rico, completely rocked the country to its core. From the state to the local, right, to the locals, even us here in the diaspora, worried about our family and friends back home, right? I mean, it was something unprecedented that the country is still trying to find its way out of. It's still trying to pick itself up and figure out what is going to happen and where it's going to go. On top of that, we add the recolonization of Puerto Rico, right? With the gentrification, the influx of North Americans, mostly white folks, rich folks, who are using tax incentives given by the government, right? Who are flooding Puerto Rico, who are buying up the beaches, who are buying up the properties, and now the influx of Airbnbs all over, all over the island, right? Where now native born Puerto Ricans can't find homes to buy, they can barely find homes to rent, Right? And it's causing a really big problem for the folks to stay inside of Puerto Rico amidst everything that has already happened. And this forced migration is not the first time, right? It is a part of Puerto Rico's history, is why I said where Puerto Ricans come from, because most of the Puerto Rican nation lives here in the United States, right? And so there are more Puerto Ricans here in the United States than there are in Puerto Rico. And a lot of times folks want to know, even Puerto Ricans like myself growing up, want to know how did that happen? Right? How did we end up in Redding, in Chicago, in New Haven, in New York, in San Francisco, in Hawaii? Right? Um, and lastly, right, what, what, what the biggest thing I think underpinning a lot of all this is the pro bill. Right? So under President Obama, we have this, this, uh, this economic plan that was put in place to basically recuperate money from debt that Puerto Rico had amassed throughout the years. Puerto Rico's economy has always been dependent of the United States, right? And has primarily lived off dependency and debt, loans from the United States to be able to pay for infrastructure, to be able to pay for a lot of the things that, that go on in Puerto Rico. In 2018, Wall Street decided to call in those debts, right? And the government said, you have to pay up. A debt that we believe is not the responsibility of the Puerto Rican people to begin with, right? But the federal government of the United States is saying you have to pay and impose a fiscal control board that ultimately has replaced the government in place, the colonial government in Puerto Rico, 
as the decision-making body for Puerto Rico. And so through this program that's out there, in order to recuperate money for Wall Street bankers and hedge funders, they are going through a process of austerity where they have closed hundreds of public schools, they're closing public services, they're privatizing public services like the electricity, transportation, all of those things, right? Which continues to drive Puerto Rico into a, a state of dependency on the United States and continues to push people out of the island because there is just nothing left, right? And so what happens? As a result, there's been a wave of protests uh, that we've seen on the island of Puerto Rico and also over here in response to a lot of, of what's happening over there, right? And so a lot of this starts with the Enrique Penuncia campaign, right? But even before that, we go back to Hurricane Maria, right? Where folks, where the federal government had left, both the United States federal government and the Puerto Rican government had abandoned the people and it was sort of like, fend for yourself. If it wasn't for the diaspora stepping in and helping out, a lot of our folks would have been completely left in misery, left to die, which unfortunately almost 5,000 of them did die, right? But many more would have died had it not been for the diaspora and the support that we were able to give because the government both here in Puerto, in Puerto Rico and here in the United States had completely abandoned the folks. And what you see is a lot of the rise of mutual aid, right? Mutual aid organizations, mutual aid programs popping up all over Puerto Rico, Puerto Ricans depending on themselves. Puerto Rico is no longer looking to the United States, no longer looking to, the, to their local government and depending on themselves to provide for themselves. What we also see is the, is the arrival of U.S. philanthropy, right? And the non-profitizing of that resistance and of that struggle inside of Puerto Rico, which completely changed the dynamic of what resistance to colonization and what resistance to the corrupt government in Puerto Rico looks like. So with the influx of millions of dollars, particularly from the Open Society Foundation, from Ford Foundation, from Maria Fund, and institutions like that, right? What you see is the propping up of now nonprofit organizations or smaller groupings of people who have entered activism, right, through funding from the United States, working on single issue campaigns, right? And so one of the unique aspects of nonprofit organizing if you're going to put it in the context of the United States, right, coming out of the political organizing of the 60s and 70s, is that through nonprofit organizing, a lot of social justice issues, a lot of the issues impacting our communities here in the United States and in Puerto Rico become single issue. And so now there are organizations that only focus on housing, organizations that only focus on education, organizations that only focus on uh, policing, because that's where the dollars go towards. And that's where they say, that's you have to stay in that box. And what it does is that it fractures the movement, it fractures that resistance and breaks it up into these little silos that compete for funding from U.S. foundations, U.S. billionaires, right? And also compete with each other for visibility, for gatekeeping purposes and all that, and it keeps the movement docile. Lastly, we have the issue of the plebiscites. And so Puerto Rico up to this point has already had about 15 different plebiscites on the status question, which are basically elections where the Puerto Rican citizens decide what their fate is, right? The United States, in its benevolence and its, in its good nature, said, listen, we'll give you a vote. You decide what you want. You want to be a state? Cool. You want to be independent? Cool. You want to stay in this sort of commonwealth status? Wonderful. What we know is that that's a shell game. It's a fraud. It's political theater at best. Right? Because the Puerto Rican people do not decide their fate. The ones who decide that is the Congress of the United States. Right? The folks who have the final decision and the final say on what those plebiscites say live here in the United States. It's the Congress of the United States. Those plebiscites have often been used for the same purposes of dividing the people, right? Having them compete with each other, having them fight with each other, and take their eyes off the actual, right, the invisible hand controlling all this, which is the government of the United States. Now, we can do the next slide. So now what happens? We move into this 21st century decolonization, right? And so now in, 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 the, in this moment of crisis, this moment of catastrophe, where this issue of Puerto Rico's status, Puerto Rico's relationship to the United States is put on blast, Donald Trump throwing paper towels at the Puerto Rican people, the federal government and FEMA, FEMA leaving folks to die, the local corrupt government making fun of the 4,000 plus dead uh, people who died in Maria, 
right? The question of what our relationship to the United States is back on the table again, like it hasn't been in a long time. And we have opportunists, political opportunists taking advantage of that. And so here we have Nia Velasquez and uh, AOC. Specifically why? Because they're the ones who introduced a self-determination act, right? To try and resolve and settle Puerto Rico status in relationship to the United States, right? Colonization now for the federal government, for some in the federal government of the United States, for some in the government of Puerto Rico, is now no longer a good thing, right? And so now it's no longer activists and political folks talking about the colonization of Puerto Rico, but now it's all the other folks who take full advantage of that colonization of Puerto Rico, discuss Puerto Rico, and want to reshape what decolonization looks like, right? Well, you also have the renewed calls for statehood. Again, both coming from the traditional annexation wing of, of the Puerto Rican government and also Puerto Rican society, right, who want Puerto Rico to become the 51st state, but then also from the Democratic Party here in the United States and those folks who believe that a 51st state, Puerto Rico become the 51st state with its political representation can tilt the scales in the favor of the Democratic Party in Congress, in the Senate, and in the White House for future generations to come, right? And so because it serves their political aspirations, now again, statehood is put back on, back on the table. The Self-Determination Act, while it gives the illusion that it gives the people of Puerto Rico the opportunity to decide their own fate, still depends on the approval of the United States Congress. So whatever is decided again in Puerto Rico still has to be approved by what we know now, a neo-Confederate, ultra-racist, white supremacist, U.S. Congress here in the United States, right? And so what we're looking at is, as Franz Fanon had put it, a dying colonialism. The colonial reality of Puerto Rico no longer serves neither the bourgeois corporate interests in Puerto Rico. It doesn't serve the people themselves in Puerto Rico. It doesn't serve production in Puerto Rico, employment in Puerto Rico. It doesn't serve the Puerto Rican future. It doesn't serve the aspect, it doesn't even serve the, 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 the federal government of the United States anymore. And we're entering a new phase in this relationship of what Puerto Rico's 500 plus year colonial reality is going to look like. And so I wanna make this point. As we look at how did we get here? How did Puerto Rico arrive here? Right, we start with this quote from Frederick Engels. In every historical epoch, the prevailing mode of production and exchange is the basis upon which society is organized. The mode of production is what decides how society is organized. And we talk about the mode of production, we're talking about everything that goes into production of life, the tools, the raw materials, the, 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 the structures, right? And the relationships between the humans in that production, bosses and workers. How you organize that and what that looks like ultimately decides what your society is going to be structured at and organized as in order to serve that purpose. And so we start with Spanish conquest, right? When the European invaders came in 1493, they came for the purpose of that profit, expanding their profit, right? Seeking gold, seeking spices, enslaving the native population, right? Almost eradicating them completely, right? Searching for gold, searching for gold. With the eradication of the indigenous population that already lived in, in Puerto Rico, near eradication of the indigenous population, they imported enslaved Africans to do that work, right? As the gold mines are depleted, sugar becomes the number one crop in Puerto Rico of which the African, right, the enslaved Africans uh, mixed race folks were working and producing. 1789, feudalism around Europe starts to crumble. The rise of capitalism, right, is beginning with the French Revolution of 1789. In the United States, in the U.S. colonies, industrialization has begun, right? Capitalism begins here in the, in the Western Hemisphere in the so-called America. In Latin America and the Caribbean, though, Spain is still able to hold on to its feudal system, right? Meaning that while factories and industrial merchants and, and the, the rule, the divine rule of kings and queens is falling in Europe, has already fallen here in the United States, 
in the Americas and the Caribbean, you still have a feudal system that exists that relies on this sort of serfdom, right? This this sort of like sharecropping and paying tithes back to the mother country, which was Spain. At this time, you also have the growing of a Creole elite. And to be very clear, Creole in the Puerto Rican sense, Creole in the Latin American sense does not mean the same thing as like Creoles uh, or the Creoles in like Louisiana, right? What this means refers to those, uh, those folks who were born in Puerto Rico. So the descendants of Spaniards who came and settled in Puerto Rico, their sons and daughters were referred to as Creoles. Creole is also a, uh, uh, it's another name, right? The standing for white. And so when you hear of Criollos, when you hear of Creoles, right? In this time, it's standing for white. So you have a white bourgeois class that oversees this sort of like serfdom, right? That, that exists in Puerto Rico through slavery, through the genocide of the native population, right? And, and the enslavement of the African population on behalf of the Spanish crown. Another wing of this bourgeois class, right? Again, these white elites who were educated in Europe, who were educated in other places, right? On one end, want to serve the Spanish crown, right? On the other end, are seeking independence. For many of those in the growing capitalist class, again, this feudal system, right? This circum doesn't fit. It doesn't work for them. Why are we paying money off to Spain when we can keep this for ourselves? All the sugar production, all the tobacco production, we can keep it for ourselves. A wing of that group decides, no, 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 right? We need complete, complete separation from, from, from Spain. So instead of having this autonomous wing where we can do it for ourselves, but we still want to fly under the Spanish flag, Right? but we want to be the ones in control, there's another group that says, no, 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 Spain shouldn't exist in Puerto Rico at all, period. 1804, you have the Haitian Revolution. And why is that significant? That's, that's a question for you. Why is 1804 important? It's a spark point for Caribbean independence, right? It is the first independent nation in the Western Hemisphere. It is the first black nation to free itself in the Western Hemisphere. It serves as a shining star, right? An example to the other enslaved nations, the other enslaved islands in the Caribbean of what can be done, right? Following that wave and understanding that, we have the birth and the arrival of Don Ramon and Meterio Betance, right? Part of this bourgeois class, doctor educated in Europe, but also abolitionist, who does not believe in the system of slavery. The son of a Dominican father, Puerto Rican mother, right? He says, no, 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 we are not Spanish subjects. We aren't even Spanish people. We are Puerto Rican. We are Puerto Rican. Of that class of people, predominantly coming from the enslaved Africans, descendants of the enslaved Africans, and descendants of those mixed race folks who were living in Puerto Rico, some of the criollos, they had no other country to point to. The only place that they could call home or have any reference was Puerto Rico. And therefore, they became the Puerto Ricans, the initial Puerto Ricans. Don Betance says, we are Puerto Rican, we are not Spanish. And we need our independence because Haiti has shown the way. And not only do we need our independence, but all the islands in the Caribbean need their independence, need their liberation, but also need to come together under an Antillian federation. We are all one family. One region, one family, from Jamaica all the way to the Virgin Islands, all the way to St. Lucia and St. Croix, all one family, one people. In 1868, these elites, with the support from the Dominican Republic, right, and the comrades in the revolution of the Dominican Republic, launch a revolution in the town of Lares, El Grito de Lares. El Grito de Lares was primarily an abolitionist movement. It was an abolitionist revolt. What they understood was that Puerto Rico cannot be free unless the African, enslaved African is free. At the time, Puerto Rico's population was almost 50-50 white and black. Black and or mixed race. Which is important because right now Puerto Rico is the whitest country in the entire Caribbean. 
which didn't happen by accident. Right? With this revolt, they proclaimed not only a free and independent Puerto Rican Republic, but they proclaimed the Puerto Rican nation. This is the first time where Puerto Rican people announced themselves as Puerto Rican people and a Puerto Rican nation with a distinct culture, a distinct identity, right? And did not you know, pertain or belong to Spain. That resistance movement was undermined. It was sold out by that bourgeois class that wanted to maintain a certain level of autonomy, right? They wanted the freedom from Spain, but not total independence. They wanted to keep control of the island and its profits while still flying under the Spanish flag. And so snitched, told, did everything they could to undermine that revolt. And the next day, the revolt was defeated. The leaders of the revolt were exiled. Don Betances returned back to Europe. Other folks left the United States. Some went back to the Dominican Republic. Some left to Cuba. But it wasn't a total defeat. Because again, what happened was that Puerto Rican nation was proclaimed. Puerto Rican nationhood was embedded in the people of Puerto Rico, right? And ultimately, abolition was abolished. Excuse me, slavery was abolished. The ruling government at the time, the Spanish crown, were like, look, this is getting bad. This is real bad. They're revolting. We can't keep this institution because they're not going to take it anymore, right? They're not going to They're not gonna put up with this anymore. And through a five-year span, ultimately abolished, abolished abolition, excuse me, abolished slavery to try and pacify the movement at the time and pacify those enslaved Africans, pacify the people who were revolting. And if I'm going too fast, let me turn real stop. So that brings us to the, to the U.S. invasion. Yankees suck. As a Mets fan, Yankees suck. As a Puerto Rican, Yankees suck. Right? 1845, Manifest Destiny becomes a thing in the United States. Manifest Destiny says that the United States has a divine right, a divine purpose to go and conquer the West. Right? To bring democracy and capitalism to the West. Why is that important to United States history, that conquering of the West? What does that do? It makes it a superpower across the world. Why? Economics, right? Economics and control. With that came the development of the railroad system, right? Textile manufacturing, arms manufacturing, right? The wars today in the Ukraine, Afghanistan, Iraq make billions and billions of dollars for more manufacturers. Manifest Destiny made a lot of money for war manufacturers because if you are going to conquer half of Mexico, you're going to need a lot of guns to do that. If you are going to wipe out hundreds and millions of indigenous nations here in the United States, you're going to need a lot of guns to do that. And with the conquering of Mexico and taking of the West, right, the building of the railroad system, the manufacturing of textiles, the United States capitalism begins to grow and positions itself as a world power. Under that manifest destiny, it also looks at the entire region, right, as its divine right, as its divine property, right, from the United States all the way down to the southern tip of Argentina and the Caribbean. So while... Spain is battling these wars of independence primarily with Cuba, right? The Puerto Rican exiles are in New York City, plotting with the Cuban revolutionaries, Jose Martí, right? Plotting on how are we going to free Cuba and Puerto Rico now that Spain is weak. In New York City, the Puerto Rican flag is created, right? Prior to that, the flag of Puerto Rico was the one of the Tamalades, which was intentionally created to look like the flag of the Dominican Republic in a show of solidarity and sisterhood with our, our Dominican brothers and sisters on the island, which that itself was created, right, modeled off the Haitian flag in solidarity and honor of the, of the Haitian people in the Haitian Revolt of 1804. Again, the notion of nationhood. Now Puerto Ricans have a flag, right? And this, nation, this idea of nationhood continues to be embedded. The Spanish-American War starts in 1898 when the United States sees Spain as weak. They're fighting against Cuba. They can't handle it anymore. And the United States attacks. Under the, the Treaty of Paris, 
The United States takes Puerto Rico as their property, Cuba, the Philippines, right, Guam, and other places. But ultimately what they did was they broke the feudal system that existed in that region and introduced capitalism to the islands. Of those countries, Puerto Rico was the only one to remain a colony, right, and property of the United States. The United States used it as a military outpost. They used it to take control over the booming sugar plantation, excuse me, sugar industry at that time, to increase their profits, to your point, right, to continue their power and control over the region. With U.S. colonization, Puerto Rico becomes an unincorporated territory legally by the Congress of the United States in the early 1900s, which means that they legally can take control over the market because it's already theirs because that's our territory, right? And Puerto Rico now changes masters. And that bourgeois elite of autonomous folks who want to undermine El Grito de Latin, and we're like, we want to take control of Puerto Rico, keep control of Puerto Rico, but find the, the Spanish flag, all of a sudden we're like, yay, Uncle Sam. As long as we still get to stay here, cool. Whatever flag you all want to fly, as long as it's not that Puerto Rican one, we're all good. Right? Through this military outpost, the United States is able to keep in control and begin the control of Central America, of South America, and the Caribbean. From there, they can launch attacks and have launched hundreds of attacks, right, on our sister nations throughout Latin America, right, and contain the Caribbean region from one end, the United States mainland on the one side, and Puerto Rico on the other. With U.S. colonization becomes the industrialization process of Puerto Rico. Again, the modes of production. It moves from a plantation to society and now moves into this manufacturing capital industrial society. What you have now are all the farmers, a lot of them who live in the countryside, produce sugar, are now pushed into the cities and the metropolitan areas of Puerto Rico, right, to work in these factories. 1917 is important because globally what's happening in 1917 and I can't see if the folks in the chat are answering the question, but 1917, what's happening around the world? World War One. World War One. Right? Citizenship is imposed on Puerto Ricans. This is very important. Citizenship is imposed on Puerto Ricans. Puerto Rico never asked for U.S. citizenship. Puerto Rico never asked for incorporation into the United States government. Why would the United States give citizenship rights to a group of, at the time, the numbers were, were depleting because of the whitening process, right? Giving tax incentives and land, uh, land incentives to white Europeans to come colonize, right? And come settle in Puerto Rico to drive down the numbers of the black population and the mixed race population. Coming out of the Haitian Revolution, because the Haitian Revolution sent fear up the spine of every colonial power in the world, right? Those who control Puerto Rico try to get ahead of it and we're like, no, 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 stop the migration of black migrants from neighboring islands and countries into Puerto Rico and gave land, right, to white settlers to whiten the population. But it's still a mixed race society. So why would this extremely racist 1917 United States government give citizenship to a mixed race society way out in the Caribbean. Political control over the islands. Right? Soldiers. Soldiers. You're a citizen now. That means you can be drafted. And drafted we were. And in the world wars, Puerto Ricans were drafted in incredible numbers to go fight in Europe. And as Europe is destroying itself, fighting itself, right? The United States is growing is growing in economic power and political power, right? Again, through tax incentives to corporations in the United States, they bring factories to Puerto Rico, right? And begins the, the proletarization of the Puerto Rican, the Puerto Rican uh, uh, population. And again, those sugar workers and those farmers that live in the countryside, now you become workers in factories. But if most of the men are being drafted into the war, who is working in the factories? Women predominantly, right? And as we understand in, in the patriarchal society that we live in, when women are the workers, the pay, the conditions, all that sink even lower 
than the atrocious levels they were already beginning at. Right? And so the violent oppression of the fight back and the resistance to that begins also by the United States. Right? And what we have in this, and, and a, key, a, a key point in regards to women, what you also have is the process of the sterilization. The sterilization process of the Puerto Rican woman at this time begins in the early 1900s and lasts all the way into the 1980s. Because we need production, because we need products, because Europe is dying and blowing itself up, right? We have an opportunity to take control of the global market. We need products produced. We can't have you getting pregnant, leaving work, right? And so what they would do is they would secretly sterilize the women. It was referred to as la operación, the operation. On their lunch breaks, demanding that women workers in these factories go into an office, a makeshift clinic that was built inside these factories and get sterilized. What was told to them was that they were being given birth control, that it could be reversed, but it was not. It was an attempt to keep workers in the factories, but also to shrink the numbers of the Puerto Rican population on the island, who again were predominantly mixed blood, right, mixed race folks. And the men are at war dying, right? And women can't reproduce. Exactly, exactly. And you stunt Puerto Rican production and you stunt again that resistance movement coming out of El Grito de Lares, right, a few years before. This gives rise to the Nationalists and the Nationalist Party, founded in 1922. In the beginning, a bourgeois party, right, a party of, of petty bourgeois elites, lawyers, doctors, professionals, right, who wanted their, their liberation from, from uh, the United States, but were still living in that sort of like upper strata, right? So the fight wasn't really that hard because they were still benefiting from that, that capitalist system. Don Pedro de Su Campos, Harvard graduate, the son of a formerly enslaved woman, right, comes back home from Puerto Rico after graduating Harvard University being trained, right, and reared politically by the Irish Republican movement, exiled in Boston at the time, comes back to Puerto Rico to lead the Nationalist Party, right, and again starts the resistance against this new colonizer, this new occupation, and the violent repression that's happening to the Puerto Rican people. In 1934, the sugarcane workers, which were the largest workers on the island because sugarcane was the primary product coming out of Puerto Rico, decided to go on strike. And what they decided was that they didn't want their labor organization to represent them, and they didn't want the Socialist Party that existed in Puerto Rico at that time to represent them because both sided with the autonomous movement that said they wanted some level of freedom and self-determination for Puerto Rico, but not total independence from the United States. Following the labor imperialism of Samuel Gompers and the AFL, who also were taking advantage of the Puerto Rican workers, as we still see today the AFL do, as we have seen the SEI, SEIO, SEIU do, as we've seen the AFT, right, in breaking strikes in Puerto Rico, in trying to break homegrown unions in Puerto Rico to absorb those workers into U.S. labor unions for their own profiteering and their own power control, they called on Don Pedro. Don Pedro to represent them. Don Pedro represents the workers, right, they win as much as they can, but what that does is, is that it now brings the Nationalist Party, right, sworn, committed to the defense of the Puerto Rican nation. And again, this concept of nationhood. We are Puerto Ricans. We are Catholic. We speak Spanish. We are Caribbean. We are Latin American, is what they said. We are not this, you Protestants, you white people, you folks who don't speak Spanish, who come from a whole other place of snow and ice. We are two completely different people. Right? And we are no longer going to accept this subjugation and this new enslavement under the stars and bars. With the strike, the Puerto Rican people and the workers are now introduced to this, to this ideology, right? And it catches and it spreads like wildfire. The Nationalist Party and Don Pedro also say you need to boycott elections. Because what the United States did was in bringing democracy, as they brought it to Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya, try to bring it to the Ukraine, and so on and so forth, right? They brought elections with them, right? You can vote for representatives, and, and you can vote for this and that. 
But ultimately, who do we say has the final say when it comes to those votes? The U.S. Congress. And what the nationalists and Don Pedro recognize was that those elections are, again, political theater, only set up to divide us and have us fighting each other and competing for campaign funds, for some level of, of, of influence, for some level of privilege, right, with, with, with the ruling power. But ultimately, it doesn't change our, our colonial condition. It doesn't change, right, uh, the slavery that exists in Puerto Rico. And so they move into a period of what I refer to as valor y sacrificio, valor and sacrifice. It comes from the quote from Don Pedro, la patria, the homeland, es valor y sacrificio. The homeland is valor and sacrifice. And what does that mean? That in the face of the repressions, the massacre in Ponce, the massacre in Rio Piedras, the sterilization of our women, the sending of our young men off to war to die in two world wars like cannon powder in the 50s, right, in Korea, the Nationalist Party struck back. They killed the head of the Puerto Rican police, Colonel Francis Riggs, who was responsible for the killing of Sandino in, in, in Nicaragua, right? They attempt the assassination of Harry Truman, right? They engage in open conflict with Lolita Lebron, right? Rafael Cancel Miranda and the attack on Congress in 1954. The only country, the only country with that honor to ever be able to strike the United States in the heart of their empire has been Puerto Rico. The only country who has ever been able to wage that level of fight on U.S. soil in direct confrontation with the United States has been Puerto Rico. Right. And so amidst this wave of violence, right, in defense of Puerto Rican nationhood, in defense of the Puerto Rican identity, and against U.S. colonialism, against U.S. enslavement, corporate enslavement, political enslavement, economic enslavement, right? The United States decides we have to do something. And in 1952, they officially made Puerto Rico a commonwealth. Colonies are illegal under United under United Nations. Colony is a bad name. That's a throwback to the imperial days of the, of, of the divine rule of Spain, of France, of Germany. We're not that. We are, we, are, we are the beacon of liberty. We don't do that. We have a commonwealth. And with that commonwealth, we are going to give you yet another electoral system where you can now choose your leader. And for the first time, Puerto Ricans can choose their governor. The illusion of democracy. You are choosing your own leadership. You are choosing your own government. You decide who, right, who rules and who runs Puerto Rico. But we still know who runs. You're just a governor, right? We know who runs Puerto Rico. It's still the United States. At this time, the Puerto Rican flag becomes the official flag of Puerto Rico. Before 1952, the Puerto Rican flag was not the flag of Puerto Rico, officially or legally. It hasn't been that long ago, right? They changed the colors from sky blue to navy blue to make it look like the United States and embarked right, on, on, a, on, on a path of free associated states, ELA, right? Blurring the lines between colonialism, self-determination, anything but independence. We're not those nationalists. The nationalists are exiled off to New York and to the United States. And what is left is Luis Muñoz Marin, Puerto Rico's first elected governor, right, to start the process of colonization, recolonization of Puerto Rico. Operation Bootstrap from the 50s to 60s is an economic plan imposed on Puerto Rico again that gives more tax incentives and exemptions to, Puerto, to U.S. companies to come to Puerto Rico, right? They use Puerto Rico at this time as a model for the rest of Latin America. Look what we have done for Puerto Rico. Look at these buildings. Look at the citizenship, right? Look at the wages that we give. You're all still living in mud roads, under development, right? Look at these Puerto Ricans. This is what the United States can do for you. 
at the same time, because of the manufacturing that's happening at a rapid pace and all the machinery that's happening, you end up with a surplus population, what they refer to as all those Puerto Ricans who were left unemployed. Because now sugarcane is no longer the main crop. It's no longer the main product. Most of these folks live in the cities now, but there's not enough work for everybody. And so now you have hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans that have been left unemployed because of Operation Bootstrap. At the same time, 1959, way on the other side in Cuba, what happens? Fidel. Fidel arrives on the boat, right? Like the Messiah coming out of the heavens. Fidel and his army liberate Cuba, right? And the Cuban Revolution begins. And what the United States now does is use Puerto Rico and this Commonwealth status as a model system to rival that that the Cubans are modeling in the Western Hemisphere. You don't need socialism. You don't need communism. You don't need that over there. You need this, because look at Puerto Rico. With this in the Cuban Revolution, in terms of the resistance, right, because a lot of folks have been exiled, and that's been exiled, gives rise to the Marxist movement inside of Puerto Rico. La Nueva Lucha. And this is where you start to see the beginning of explicitly Marxist organizations rise in Puerto Rico. They're calling out right, the evils of capitalism, calling out the evils of this co uh, of colonization by the United States, and looking at Cuba as the model. What you also have at this time is the rise and the creation officially of the statehood party. Partially created by who? Cuban exiles who have fled, right? Who have fled Cuba and the revolution and have come to Puerto Rico, have established themselves in Puerto Rico, right? Among that ruling bourgeois elite and create the statehood party, calling for full annexation of Puerto Rico to the United States and make it, right, the 51st state. That surplus population, what are we gonna do with all these extra people, right? The United States government, all these reports are saying there's an overpopulation problem in Puerto Rico. Poverty in Puerto Rico is the is is the is the result of overpopulation. It's not us. It's not our factories where all of the profits, right, are leaving Puerto Rico and are going back to the United States. All the products are being made in Puerto Rico, sent back to the United States, and then sold back to Puerto Rico and sold back to the rest of the world. But that's not what's causing poverty. It's overpopulation. But we have we have a plan for that because guess what? We have a whole bunch of factories popping up in New England, in New York, in Philadelphia, in Chicago as well. Bring them over here, right? And so what you have is with this change in economic system, when Puerto Rico moves from monocultural, right, sugar economy and agricultural economy into this industrial economy of capitalism, right? Then you see the rampant unemployment <clears throat> Right, that leaves hundreds of thousands of people with no jobs, nowhere to go, and ultimately are put on planes and sent to the United States. This is how we get here. So many of us born and raised in the United States, this is how it happened. For a lot of us, our grandparents came on those planes. Great grandparents came on those planes. And to show you, right, to show you what the United States thought of, there's this picture here of uh, mostly men, mostly black, right? Being put on cargo planes, in lawn chairs, in beach chairs, and sent off the United States, like cargo. Black skin bodies put in cargo planes and sent off the island forever to go work in the factories in the United States. I put the migration in quotes because it is sold to us as the migration. But they were refugees. They're economic and political refugees. Many persecuted because of their political beliefs. Many who were left unemployed with nowhere provided for their families because of the capitalist system that was imposed inside of Puerto Rico. To note, at the same time as the Puerto Rican migration from 1948 into the 1950s, there's another great migration, great migration in the United States. And what is that? Yes. 
Yes, right? African Americans, the black population moving from the south to the north, referred to as the Great Migration, also refugees. New African refugees who are escaping also economic exploitation and white supremacist terror and lynchings in the South, forced to move to the North into the same factories, the same cities in New Haven, Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, Detroit. And it's not enough time to get into that, right? But this begins the unique relationship that Puerto Rican people and the Puerto Rican community has with African Americans in this country. Again, didn't happen by accident, was a, a, a result of capitalism and white supremacist violence that pushed black skinned people out of their homes, off their land, and into factories in the North. At this time, Puerto Rico continues to be a military outpost with the war in Korea, acting as a launching pad, right, again, to keep the Caribbean and Latin America in check because the whole world has, 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 is, is, is revolting, right, and we have to make sure we hold our position in power. The diaspora, as we are referred to, is the exiled nation, really, is what we are. It's an exiled nation, right, forced to leave our home. The turbulent 70s, it's the rise of the Black Panther Party, it's the Young Lords, right? It's, it's a lot of social justice movement coming out, the victories of the civil rights, right? The civil rights movement, the civil rights era, right? It's the beginning of neoliberalism here in the United States, the free market, the privatization, right? The decentralization of the economy, the moving, uh, the developing of, of factories, right? Moving, closing factories, again, in the Midwest and places like Philadelphia and these other places, ultimately leaving places like North Philly, Detroit, places in slums because those factories closed and they were the number one employer of people, right? More tax incentives to companies to come to Puerto Rico, right? Set up your factories, continue to displace folks and Vietnam. And again, we're citizens, so who gets drafted? Puerto Ricans. Puerto Rican young men are sent off to die in the jungles of Vietnam while Puerto Rican women are left to work in these factories, right? Producing, producing more product, more products at a record rate for US corporations that have left the mainland United States, have left Detroit, Chicago, North Philly, Bridgeport, Connecticut, all of these places in just devastation, all for profit, right? Of the owning class of the United States of America. Revolution is in the air. At the same time, with the victories of China, with the victory in Cuba, with the victory in Guinea-Bissau, with the victory in Angola, with the victories of revolutions all over the world, right? The Vietnamese on, on their way to defeat the, 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 the Yankee Empire. The Red Star, right, flies over the global south. And folks are looking to Marxism as the way. And not only Marxism, but revolution and decolonization in the Fanonian sense. That the only way colonized people can win their liberation, right, is by meeting force with a much greater force. Meeting violence, as Fanon put it, with greater violence. And so you give a rise, again, a resurgence of the Puerto Rican resistance to the atrocities that happened to Puerto Rican people, not only in Puerto Rico, but now here in the United States, right? In the story of the Young Lords, the story of, of the Black Panthers, and all the, all the things that are happening here, and a rise to the armed struggle. In the tradition of Don Pedro de Sucampo and the Nationalist Party, who were in the tradition of Don Ramón Ametero Betances and El Grito de Lare, in the name of the Puerto Rican nation, which now transcends the Atlantic. It's both in the United States and it's both in Puerto Rico. Con la revolución no se firman contratos, se firman compromisos. Fidel Castro. With the revolution, right, you don't sign contracts, you sign, right, a compromise. It's a commitment is a commitment that you make to the revolution, is a commitment that you make to the struggle, is a commitment that you make to the defense of your people. 
And so we move into this new phase, right? Of the wretched, of what Fanon, read Fanon, everybody at home, read Fanon. Everybody should read Fanon, read Fanon again, and then read them again. The wretched of the earth, those black, Asian, Latino bodies around the world suffering under the boot of capitalism, Yankee colonialism, European colonialism, right? Struggling, struggling to stay alive, struggling to keep their families alive, enter a new phase of struggle to strike back against their colonizers. And again, with the victory of the Portuguese in Africa, right? With the victory of the imperial powers in China, with the victories of the Spanish United States in Cuba, with the victories of the Yankee Empire in Vietnam, there's a new model that has been shown. And in Puerto Rico, organizations rise up to meet this challenge. The most popular of them all, Los Macheteros, an explicitly Marxist organization, right, seeking to bring about, like many other organizations in Puerto Rico, a Marxist revolution, Cuban style, in Puerto Rico to liberate Puerto Rico from its, at this point, 300, 400 year enslavement under Spanish and Yankee colonization. International solidarity becomes a thing. It has always been a thing for the Puerto Rican people since the days of Spain, right? And so they launch attacks against the, the, the Yankee empire in Puerto Rico and in the United States in solidarity, one with the Puerto Rican people, but also right with all those folks fighting back against colonialism around the world. The electoral process continues. And in this now, you have a three-party system in Puerto Rico, statehood party, the Commonwealth Status Quo Party, and an independence party. You have plebiscites. Again, the charade that somehow any of these parties could do anything on behalf of the Puerto Rican people, that they could do anything to free Puerto Rico of that subjugation. When Haiti tried it, they got Marines. When Santo Domingo got it, tried it, right, in 65 and 66, they got the Marines. Right? When anybody in this hemisphere has tried to do right by their people, they get the U.S. Marines. Till this day, you try to do right by your people, you get the U.S. Marines. Right? Fast forward to bring us back to where we are. NAFTA in the 90s pops up, the North, North American Free Trade Agreement, that ultimately decimates this period of economic boom, right, of the charade of economic stability in Puerto Rico, because now all of those factories that once had tax incentives to come to Puerto Rico have now packed up their bags and have gone, right, elsewhere, India and other parts of the world where they can set up sweatshops and they can pay even lower wages, right, and make even more profit. And this ultimately decimates the, 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 the economics, right, the, 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 the economy of Puerto Rico and begins a much deeper entrenched dependency on U.S. aid and loans for the Puerto Rican government and the Puerto Rican people. So what does this mean today? Puerto Rico continues to be a military outpost. At one point in its history, there were more bases in Puerto Rico than there were in any other place around the world. 13. At its peak, the United States military had 13 military bases in Puerto Rico. They were bombing the island of Vieques. They were testing Agent Orange in Vieques so they could use it in Vietnam. They were launching attacks from Puerto Rico in Yugoslavia, right? They're attacking Cuba. They're making sure that the Haitians never, ever, ever rise up again. They make sure that Santo Domingo doesn't go socialist like it tried to do in the 60s, right? And they make sure that the rest of Latin America stays in place because of all of the military assaults that are being launched from Puerto Rico. That puts Puerto Rico in a very peculiar position with the rest of the islands in the Caribbean, right? And Latin America where they're like, our death is coming from your shores. Those bombs, those planes are coming from your shores. What we see now today is that with those tax incentives that continue to exist in Puerto Rico, you have this influx of investors, new tax codes and new tax breaks for millionaires from the United States to go to Puerto Rico, settle in Puerto Rico, not have to pay any income taxes, right? 
invest in Puerto Rico and what they're doing are buying up Puerto Rico. An influx of North American white people, which has always happened, right? The influx of white people to Puerto Rico to suppress the movement, to maintain control of the island and the Caribbean as a whole from Puerto Rico are coming and are displacing Puerto Ricans, native Puerto Ricans, Airbnbs everywhere. The majority of the islands of Culebra, the majority of the islands of Vieque are all Airbnb. The metropolitan areas in Puerto Rico, San Juan, Diego, San Juan, and Ponce are Airbnbs. We as Puerto Ricans here in the so-called diaspora can't even dream of ever going back to Puerto Rico or buy something because our families over there can't even hold on to their homes or buy something because they are just for the new Yankee invader, the new Yankee colonizer coming with their millions of dollars in their so-called investment. The crypto bros who want to turn Puerto Rico into a, a, a crypto mecca wreaking havoc on the island, privatizing the beaches, you live on an island and can no longer go to the beach because that beach is property of somebody who lives in Arkansas. National production in Puerto Rico is not allowed. Puerto Rico cannot produce for itself. The United States won't let it. So it has to take loans. It has to borrow from, from, from the U.S. government and create further entrenched that dependency, right? The forced displacement. During the Great Migration, that so-called Great Migration, in that slide that I showed you back here, underneath the, the, the chairs, 1950s to 1960, saw 470,000 Puerto Ricans leave the island. At the time, the population of Puerto Rico was 2,100,000 people. Right now, those who have left since Maria is up around 600,000 Puerto Ricans have left Puerto Rico. In the 90s, at one point, almost 4 million Puerto Ricans on the, on the island. We are now less than 3 million and shrinking every year. In 20 years, there will be no Puerto Rico left for Puerto Ricans because what they want to do is turn it into Hawaii. And when the kingdom of Hawaii was conquered, right, in 1948, I believe it was, the entire population, the entire culture was decimated and turned into a di giant resort. The people of Hawaii still continue and fight to hold on as the military destroys their water supply, destroys their land, continues to destroy sacred burial grounds, right, to build more and more resort, resorts. And that's what they want to do to Puerto Rico. And again, the impact of U.S. philanthropy on resistance, the non-profitizing of Puerto Rican resistance to U.S. colonialism, U.S. enslavement that has now seen the decimation and no longer the growing of political organizations with a distinct political ideology. But what you have are nonprofit organizations dependent on U.S. philanthropy, working on single issue campaigns, usually around specific identities or very specific you know, issues of environmentalism or housing, but stay away from the status question altogether. And so what is to be done to wrap this up? As always, since the days of Betante, since the days of Albizu, since the days of the 60s and the 70s, there needs to be principled unity among the independence movement. It is fractured right now. No one can agree, no one has ever been able to agree to mount one united struggle for independence of the country. That has allowed the United States to do what it has done. We need more political organizations beyond the U.S. imposed electoral process and nonprofit structures. The vote is not going to save us. Elections in Puerto Rico are not going to save us because the votes in this country don't save us. As long as the ruling class controls the economy, controls the government, there will never be an election right, that allows us to vote them out of power. It is a charade, it is a divide and conquer tactic. We must organize towards true decolonization. Not the decolonization that Nene Velasquez and AOC and other folks in the Democratic Party are trying to push on us, right? Where there is some sort of level of self-determination and peaceful existence with the United States that still leaves the United States in control. True decolonization means there is no more United States 
in Puerto Rico and no more United States in the Caribbean or in Latin America, hell, even in the United States altogether. And lastly, this struggle must include, include the exiled nation. The majority of Puerto Rican people, there's about 8 million of us total around the world, the majority living here in the United States, cannot happen with the, without the diaspora. And there has always been a tension with the folks in Puerto Rico and the movement in Puerto Rico, right? But it cannot be won, Puerto Rico cannot be won without the inclusion of the diaspora and the exiled nation in that process. With that, I'll leave you alone. Uh, we, can, we can answer questions. I don't know if there's any questions. I can't see the chat. So if there's questions that come up in the chat, um, yeah, thank you. if there's any questions here, comments, critiques, whatever, those of you who have arrived, yeah. So, and for those who couldn't who couldn't hear on on the Zoom, the question is right. It's it's a, a question that's always raised: is how will Puerto Rico be able to survive without the United States under independence? Right. And the question I would push back with is: Is Puerto Rico surviving now with the United States? Right. With the United States, Puerto Rico is not surviving. There is no nowhere in the history is, is Puerto Rico surviving. And so what independence allows for is for that national production. It allows for Puerto Rico to start producing for itself and for Puerto Ricans. It allows Puerto Rico the opportunity to engage in economic and political relationships with other countries around the world to support in that economic development, to open up markets, to do that sort of thing, right? Um, right now, Puerto Rico can't do that. It does not have the right to engage in any form of economic or political relationship with another country. And so it solely depends on the United States, right? I think that there are a lot of models. Are there plans? There are a number of plans, right? The Puerto Rican Independence Party has a plan. Folks have a plan. But ultimately, right, Puerto Rico has to have the opportunity to do for itself and engage in meaningful and respectful relationships with other countries that can help support that process, right, of building the country uh, and creating a new Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so, the, so the question is then, how do you do that, right? How does Puerto Rico get to build that economy um, if all corporations and manufacturing is still owned by the United States? Am I saying nationalize those countries? Absolutely, yes, yes. Nationalized, right? Through revolution, right? Through revolution. And so what has to happen, again, is like I said before, I don't know if I can go back, right? It's, wait, let me just. So how do you do that without having the Marines? Well, that's, that's a reality. How do you do it without the Marines coming? How do you do it without the Marines? How do you, you, you so you follow the models that, that we have seen, right? So in Puerto Rico with Betante, with Don Pedro, but also Cuba, but also all around the world. It starts with political organization, right, and political education. The people in Puerto Rico need to understand that we are in a fight for our lives. They need to understand this, this history that I laid out, right, and what actually happened and what does that mean in the next 20, 
30 years, right? For our grandchildren, for those of us, there will be no Puerto Rico for us left. Hawaii is an example. We have examples of what that looks like when you allow the United States, right, to take over. And through that process of political education and political organizing, you are able to mount a real people's movement that grows into a revolution, right? The Puerto Rican workers, the Puerto Rican family, right, united in principled unity around a vision for survival and liberation. That's going to take time. That's not going to happen overnight because you're running into a, an incredible propaganda machine. And also the very real reality that the United States is not going to stand by and just let that happen. Right. But then what do you do? Lay over and die? Because we have no choice. Right. There is no other option out of this. And every other country in the world has shown that the only way out. Right. Is to struggle and fight. And that the empire at best is a paper tiger. Right. The empire, the Yankee empire has lost in Vietnam. It lost in Cuba. It lost in Afghanistan. It loses everywhere. Right. Because while it projects, it projects this invincibility. We know and have seen. Right. That it, it is not. It can be taken down. And that the rest of the world is willing to help. But that has to begin with, with us. And it starts. Right. It starts at the ground level, educating our people on the political reality, slowly building that trust, slowly building that power to grow up to that point, right, where then we can wage our revolution and ultimately win our liberation. But it does mean nationalizing, right, the industries and the products, taking over those means of production, right, taking over all of that and putting it to work for the Puerto Rican people as opposed to U.S. banking interests and hedge funders and millionaires over here. <laughs> If the U.S. were to step back, perhaps there's hundreds of countries lining up to give us a hand, like in Maria. There were countries saying, this is us winning. Like, you know, that's what made me say, you know, yep. we're going to become a gentleman. Yes. You know, there were countries lined up, ships lined up, we're going to come. Right. So I'm sure that we're going to have to begin. Countries will line up to give us a hand. Countries that have, uh, again, lined up to support Puerto Rico during Maria that the United States didn't allow, right? Venezuela has offered assistance. Cuba, Cuba, since the days of Martí, have always advocated for Puerto Rican independence. Suffering as she is under that 60-year embargo, barely surviving herself, right, continues to give her undying, right, and unwavering support to the people of Puerto Rico and show Puerto Rican independence. So there is no doubt that the rest of the world would not come flying, right? Because with the liberation of Puerto Rico ends, right? A key military outpost for the United States in the Caribbean ends a key point for, for uh, what you're talking about, the manifest destiny, right? Of just this profit, profit making, profit ring. All that comes to halt. When that comes to halt, it makes it very hard for the United States military and the United States government to continue to subjugate the rest of the world. Questions. questions in the chat. Has there been any concentrated effort I spiritually advise a lot of people. <laughs>
So is there is there currently a debt cancellation campaign on the to cancel the debt, the illegal debt um, that the United States is trying to to cash in on? And then basically, how do you form a revolution in Puerto Rico without the electoral process or nonprofit process? Which that's not a spiritual question; it's more like a Fidel question. Uh, I'm a spiritual advisor. I am not Fidel, but I would I would try to I would, I would try to. Um, I don't believe in God, but I do believe in shit that's God. Um, is there is there a movement to cancel the debt? Yeah, right. There are there are words to cancel, and what that looks like is movement to basically get rid of the junta, right? The fiscal control board in Puerto Rico that's closing all the schools, that sold the electrical grid, right, to to the Spanish country, that that's selling away the public sector. Of, um, of ultimately, you know. It's it's limited. So you it, it's limited because do those folks tackle the question of independence? They do. And for the most part, those folks who are working on those campaigns are pro independence, uh, pro independence folks, right? Puerto Rico is being faced with a calamity of things at the same time, and so most of the people are just fighting to survive, right? So when the teachers are going on strike because they're losing their their wages and stuff, and when the electricity keeps going out. Right, electrical workers, you know, right? There's a calamity of things that makes it very hard to rally the country around one specific, one specific thing. And so it leads us into the next question of like, how do you create, how do you create a revolution in Puerto Rico beyond electoralism and beyond the nonprofit um, industrial complex? I think one, the workers always play a key role, and you see that, right? A lot of the the manifestations against the debt, against the junta in Puerto Rico. Are led by teachers, right? Are led by electrical workers. Are led by unionized labor um, in Puerto Rico. Now you still have this this issue of labor imperialism that exists, right? And a sort of like politically underdeveloped, basically labor sector in this country as well as Puerto Rico that has abandoned those sort of like revolutionary traditions that catapulted it during the Depression era in the 1930s, right? That socialism, and so it's a return back to those politics is a return back to for unions and labor to not be only focused on their contracts and wages, right? But focus on everything, society, right? The bigger picture as a whole, because they too are community members. Oftentimes you'll hear like, well, there's workers in the community. They are community members as well, right? And so they need to go back to that tradition to be able to lead because ultimately they are the producers of these products and of this capital in Puerto Rico. If they decide to go on a general strike, everything stops, right? So the organization and the politicization of workers in Puerto Rico is key. That said, with the amount of unemployment that exists in Puerto Rico, right, the, the political education and the political organizing of the working class and the unemployed working class in Puerto Rico is also important because what is sold to them is that you're lazy. What is sold to them is that you just want welfare. Puerto Ricans don't like to work. Puerto Ricans don't want to work, right? There's enough opportunities if you just if, if you just had it in you. But all you want to do is hang out, listen to Bad Bunny, ride motorcycles, right, and, and have fun. And we know that that's not true, right? And so you need a strong political movement and political organization that can meet the people where they're at, organize them, right, rebuild that self-confidence and provide a vision of the future that they can align with. And no one has been able to do that in a principled way. Because most of the time it's stuck in an electoral process of trying to get votes. And the people are tired of voting because they know there's a charade and it doesn't mean anything, especially in a colony like Puerto Rico. You need folks to provide a vision, right? This is where the independence, the unity of the independence movement come together. As George Jackson says, right? Settle your quarrel. Come together. Fascism is already here. We don't have time for this bickering. Come together and provide a vision for the future that the Puerto Rican people can look at, believe in, and work towards because history has shown us that they will. And they will to the death. That is that. Who's doing that right now in Puerto Rico? There are folks who are attempting, but there needs to be Right, there needs to be 
a reconsolidation of the independence movement. There needs to be a realigning, a refocusing, and a re-educating of the independence movement, right, to be able to build that from scratch with the newer generation. And that also includes the United States, because oftentimes it will hurt, you know, we hear from before, it's like, well, you don't live here. So you don't get to tell us what we do because you don't live here. Right? Yeah, it's, it's everybody's question, right? Uh, right. You don't you don't live here. A question that was raised by, by Vanessa in the last class, right? And what was told to her was like, you haven't suffered no electricity here in, in whatever town in Guam or whatever. And no, I haven't. But I've suffered it in New Haven, Connecticut. No, I haven't suffered closed schools in Puerto Rico. Oh, but I suffered them here in 2013 in Philadelphia. Right? I've also suffered being called every nigger, spook, coon, jigaboo, right? Here in the United States. Speak, wet back, go back to your country here in the United States. I know what living in the United States means for our people. I know what living in the United States means for poor white people, black people, people of color, women, transgender people, poor people. I know what that is. And it's not a street paved with gold, right? And if the majority of the population lived outside the United States, not because we chose, because we don't care about Puerto Rico, love Puerto Rico, because we were forced out. We're an exiled nation, right? Diaspora is a cool name. It's not a diaspora, it wasn't voluntary. It's an exiled nation. And we're descendants of exiled people who came in the 50s and the 40s. Then it does include us. Because then we can mount a two-pronged fight here inside the belly of the beast with the support and in support of all the other subjugated and colonized nations in the United States, be they Chicano, Asian, New African, or whatever, and in Puerto Rico. Because that becomes very hard for the United States to handle. If it's just in Puerto Rico and just Puerto Ricans, we can send Marines. If four million of you are over here and now, oh my gosh, you've lined up with these 48 million African Americans and all these Asians and the 100 something million Chicanos. Wow. Wowzers, bucko. I don't, I don't know if we can deal with all that. And now, now, right? Now we're dealing with a completely different situation. That's why, right? I have a right to say, to say, and engage in this, in, in this fight. The flag was born here, just like me. It takes more of these conversations. It takes more of these faces, honest conversations, and honest critique of what have been the failures. Where have we failed in selling a future to our people as an independence movement? Where have we failed at incorporating younger generations and younger people into the movement, right, to help lead us forward? Where have we failed? Where have we been too caught up in our ego and, and, and chest thumping and spouting off beautiful quotes and history that mean nothing when the people are starving, right? Where have we failed? And how do we right those wrongs and correct and right and right the ship and, and, and correct the path? You said there was a, a question in the chat. For the United Nations. The, it still exists. Uh, folks go every year to the United Nations to, to, to speak on behalf of decolonization in Puerto Rico. This is where you see a large number of countries, like you mentioned internationally, right, verbally say they stand in support of Puerto Rican independence, right? Um, United Nations has said that colonies are illegal, right? So the United Nations more or less says, hey, USA, and that's, that's, right, that's not kosher. The U.S. is like, what are you talking about? They choose that through these elections and these purposes, and it's a commonwealth. 
right? They, they want this. And also, what are you going to do, UN? You're in New York. The UN said the war in Iraq is bad. The UN says, hey, stop picking fights around the world. And the US is like, sure. Stop giving money to Israel, right? To co complete the genocide of the Palestinians um, in that part of the world. And the US is like, whatever. And so while the UN says yes, and people go every year to the United Nations to, to speak on behalf of political independence, um, the US, excuse me, the UN just has no weight uh, to do anything about that in the face of uh, U.S. aggression, as seen in the Ukraine, Afghanistan, Libya, Yugoslavia, Panama, Venezuela, Cuba, and on and on and on. Any other? Cool. Well, I, I super greatly appreciate you all coming out and, and listening to me just go on and on with my cool little PowerPoint. Um, and all of you who are on Zoom, thank you so, so very, very much uh, for this opportunity. And hopefully this is not the last. There will be a, a presentation um, coming up after this three-part series. And Xiomara will definitely let folks know about that. But um, you can see the conversations. I'm always open to keep talking, right? And together we'll do this, bringing more folks into the conversation um, and start figuring stuff out. Little by little, folk by folk, but it will, like, we will, we will get there. We will get there. Yeah.